represents from a theological standpoint the last epic of the church before Jesus returns the body of Christ or the church or the condition that the church would be in in the last days the condition was a condition for which the Lord had nothing positive to say about the church as I studied it, all I could say was, God, help us. Because here we are serving in this time where the church overall is in decline. And the decline of the church is coming as a result of the church's refusal to be ignomatic, to be an enigma, to be different. We're living in a day now where the church wants to blend in with the world. Fewer and fewer sanctuaries and churches now even look like churches. We see the crosses taking out, taken out and strobe lights and disco lights and flashing lights put in. We see the culture influencing us much more than we influence it. They influence our lifestyle. We have changed our nomenclature, our talk. They influence what we wear. Uh, we are more enamored with them than they are with us. We, move, we meet a movie star and we all but faint. They meet us and behave as though they've met no one. It is laughable. If, if it weren't true, if it weren't so sad, our lack of influence on the surrounding culture, when you compare its influence upon us versus our ability to influence it. I was at a service not too long ago at an inaugural banquet for a preacher. The preacher is an African-American Church of God and Christ minister who had been appointed to an assignment. The guest speaker, while preaching, made a comment or two that was kind of disparaging about President Donald Trump. And given the audience he was speaking to, everybody jeered and uh, booed and whatnot, um, the mentioning of President Trump, which is... Uh, they're right. In the body of his message, he went along uh, a little further. He mentioned uh, Hillary's connection to Planned Parenthood, Hillary's connection to abortion, and Hillary's connection to the LGBT community, LGBTQ, E, F, G, all, all of them. <laughs> and when he mentioned that, the crowd was mute. And I thought to myself, both statements he made about both candidates were true. But with one candidate, they were willing to cheer. But with the other, it seemed like instead of being a Christian first, this crowd behaved more like Democrats first and Christians second. You can't be a Democrat or Republican or anything in life first and a Christian second. Because Christianity doesn't work that way. Christianity has to be first. Amen. For Christianity to be present, it has to be first. Praise the Lord. It says, seek ye first. It doesn't have to be only, but it has to be first. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Not seek ye only the kingdom, but seek ye first the kingdom. Now, whatever is second most certainly ought not to be something that conflicts with what is first. If you're intelligent. You're not going to let a thing be first and then let that first thing be accompanied by something that contradicts what you call first. 
If you do, then you're double-minded. And the Bible says the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And the Bible also says, let not that, let not that man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. The last day church is a church that doesn't seem to take its Christianity serious. Let's talk for a few minutes and we're going to get you out of here. If you say amen reasonably well, all right? The Lord indicted the church. The indictment was lukewarmness. Verse 16, so then because thou art lukewarm. Thursday night we spent time on verse 14 and 15 dealing with, especially verse 14, who is doing the talking. The amen, the so be it of God, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Beginning of the creation doesn't mean that Jesus was the first thing God created. It means that Jesus created everything. Jesus is the original cause. Everything that exists, exists because of him. Without him was there not anything made that was made. So he created God's creation. He, Jesus is God's let there be. When the Lord said let there be light, that was, that was Jesus. He's the, he's the let there be. He is the so be it of God. The amen. And uh, we talked about the necessity of living a so be it life. I want, I want my life response to God's word to be so be it. I don't want my life response to God's word to be I'll think about it. I'll pray about it. Yeah, I know what the Bible says, but no, I, my goal is for my life in every area to line up with God's word. And if God says it, then so be it. Amen. How about you? This, 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 is, this is what you want. See, you got to fight that part of you that don't want to go along with God. Amen. That part of you that contends against God's so be it. That's a word for it. It's called the flesh. Amen. See, and the flesh lusteth against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary. One to another. They clash. Praise the Lord. And if you listen to the flesh, the flesh will lead you in sin. And sin, when it is conceived, when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. So you want to, you want to challenge that part of your being that challenges God's word because you want to live a so be it lifestyle when it comes to the word of God. Amen. The Bible ought to settle the issues in your life. But the amen, the, the, the true and faithful witness, the so be it, the beginning of the creation of God said to the church at Laodicea, I know your works. I know the sum total, the sum result of your efforts. And here's what I have to say about the sum total of your efforts. When the outcome of all your labors, your work, what everything you did equal to. Here's what it came up to. It came up to something the Lord says that I find nauseating. It came up to being lukewarm. We explained, and I can't go into detail now because if I spend too much time reviewing, I won't cover any ground, that uh, with the greatness of the city of Laodicea, Laodicea had a water problem. They had a water problem. They had no natural water supply. So that was Colossi and Hierapolis, neighboring cities. Colossi had a natural supply of cold water. Hierapolis had a natural hot springs. And uh, uh, aqueducts were built from the two places about six miles apart, uh, away from uh, um, uh, Laodicea. And uh, when the hot waters of Hierapolis would, would, would flow down through the aqueduct, by the time it got to um, Laodicea, the water was no longer hot. It, 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 it actually cooled off in its travel. So by the time it arrived, it wasn't warm enough to work therapeutically. It wasn't warm enough to have an effect. You couldn't make coffee from it. it you couldn't do anything with it because it wasn't hot enough. On the other hand, the cool waters of Colossae, by the time they flowed through the aqueducts and they, they came to uh, Laodicea, that, that cold water that refreshed you, it warmed up on the way. 
And by the time it warmed up, it wasn't cool enough to refresh nor to revive. So if you needed cold refreshments, that water was no longer cold enough to revive you. It was lukewarm, so therefore it did not serve its purpose either. What the Lord describe, is describing here, and the people who received the letter fully understood it, was a church that was ineffective. A church that lacked the ability to affect the culture around it. A church that lacked the ability to move people one way or the other. The church at Laodicea was influenced more by the culture of Laodicea than it influenced the culture of Laodicea. And we certainly see this happening in the church today. He said, I would that thou were cold or hot. The truth is, by the time the water arrived, saints, it was not useful. The spiritual worthiness of the church of Laodicea was nauseating to Christ. John G. Butler had something to say about this lukewarmness. John writes, thou art neither cold nor hot. I will, because you're neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The condition of being lukewarm is a most unacceptable condition. It is summed up in the problem of the church in Laodicea. Number one, lukewarmness is a deceitful condition. This condition is especially deceitful. There is enough good in the lukewarm church to attract the spiritual. But enough evil to attract the carnal. Many churches build their crowds this way. Just enough good to get some good folk to come. But enough carnality to keep the carnal people. Praise the Lord. Those who aren't serious about Christ are happy in the lukewarm church. And those who are serious about Christ find just enough in the lukewarm church to stay there and to put up with the carnality. So whereas it looked like it is a, an effective church, we have a whole lot of members at our church. Our church is growing. We have one of the fastest growing churches in America. But it's growing by attracting carnality. And sooner or later, you have to decide whether you're going to be carnal or whether you're going to be spiritual. You can't be both. So the lukewarm church is a deceitful church, neither cold nor hot. It is a defiling church. Lukewarmness does not oppose anything. The only thing lukewarmness opposes, uh, it opposes hot and cold. That's it. Anything else is all right. Such a condition is, 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 uh, will be especially defiling because the church will not demand that you Get right with God. Lukewarm churches do not hold anybody to a standard. Do what you want to do. Say what you want to say. Go where you want to go. Play how you want to play. We're, we're glad to see you when we show up, when you show up, and uh, we understand when you're gone. Lukewarm church doesn't ask you to come out of anything. The shackers can shack. Liars can lie. Fornicators can fornicate. And everybody's serving. Lukewarm. We're not going to bother anything. There's no standard. A lukewarm protest against sin will not turn anyone away from sin. And a lukewarm support of righteousness will not gain any votes for godliness. You speak for righteousness, but you don't speak with passion and authority. Nobody will get right. You speak against sin, but if you don't speak against sin with passion and authority, no one will come out of sin. So basically, the lukewarm preacher, nobody pays him any attention. He doesn't inspire anybody to get closer to God. And he doesn't inspire anyone, praise the Lord, to come out of what's wrong. The sin, 
that you, you just, I'll tell you what you do with the, the lukewarm preacher, you enjoy him. The result of lukewarmness is that it defiles you. You're comfortable no matter what's going on in your life. It is a debilitating condition. When one is lukewarm, this kind of church will do nothing. It debilitates you. It simply goes with the crowd. It straddles the fence. It stays in the middle of the road. It is not a supporter of any side. Many churches today, you don't know where they stand on the defining issues of our time. Pay attention to your favorite TV preacher. The larger they are, the more you ought to wonder, where do they stand on issues of life? Do they talk about abortion? Praise the Lord. Ask, ask them. Ask them where do they stand on morals? What are their definitions of marriage? If you don't know, if after watching them 10 and 15 years on television, they had made clear to you where they stand, that's a lukewarm church. Because the preacher who's real and who has a position, it doesn't take but one or two sermons. Praise the Lord. And you will know where they stand. Because that's the nature of preaching. It is said, and I believe this, that if you get to know a person and you don't know what they are passionate about, what their passion is, it is said that that is because they don't have one. Because when a person is passionate about a thing, it comes out. It comes out. God bless you, Brother Thaxton. I didn't realize you were here. It comes out when you're passionate. Praise the Lord. It comes out in your speech. It comes out in your preaching. It comes out in your delivery. If you believe that Jesus is Lord and nobody knows that but you, you don't believe that Jesus is Lord because you can't believe that Jesus is Lord and keep it to yourself. Amen. The lukewarm church, which this describes most churches. Where are they? Where are the entertaining preacher who preaches and he keeps the congregation laughing and they're all giggling and having a good time as they eat their donuts and drink their coffee in the sanctuary? But where are you on the issues of the faith? What does the blood of Jesus mean to you? My God, is Jesus Christ the only Savior in your ministry? Do you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture? Or do you put other things on an equal par with the word of God? In an election, who do you stand with? Do you pay attention to personality over policy? The lukewarm church goes with party and personality. When you're spirit-led, you have to pay attention to policies. And if there's no policies that agree with your Christianity, then don't even participate at all. But you don't let yourself be driven by party. You have to be driven by what is right. Lukewarmness is debilitating. It keeps you from getting involved in the fight. The lukewarm church, someone asked me the other day, uh, just this past uh, Sunday, uh, Saturday, where are all of the preachers? When one white gentleman said to me, I, I noticed all of the preachers in the, the churches in the area uh, near this clinic, and I've been trying to find out where are the preachers? Where are the ministers? When preacher said to me yesterday, I want to take a picture of you, for you are the only pastor that I've seen down here uh, at these clinics. The members come, but we can't hardly get pastors to show up. Where are the preachers when it comes to the defining issues of our times? The lukewarm preacher is nowhere to be found because here's the problem with taking a stand. Anytime you stand for something, that automatically means you're standing against something else. Anytime you stand for someone, you're standing against someone. And so therefore, in making your stand, it may get you in trouble with the very group that you're trying to get in with. So that many times to keep from ruffling the feathers, we are lukewarm. We become silent. The lukewarm, lukewarmness, it is too weak to stand up against evil or to support the cause of truth.
Doesn't do either. Lukewarm preacher is not going to stand up against evil. But you say, come on, preacher, let's go stand for the truth. They ain't going to join you with that either. I had a preacher that was with me. I thought he was and just thought that at a certain point that the man was trying to nurse him along and we're going to get out here and we're going to fight the good fight of faith together. But one excuse too many. One excuse too many. One reason why I can't stand too many. One reason why I don't want to go too many said to me, he doesn't have the fight. Can't make a man be what he is not. Can't give him what he don't have. If he doesn't have the conviction and he's not, if the Lord hadn't given it to him, you got to let him go. And you got to go on anyway. The lukewarm preacher has no conviction. He's too weak to stand up against evil or to support the cause of truth. Individually, it is too, it is not cold enough to bring conviction of sin. Neither is it warm enough to bring consecration uh, to spirituality. Oh my, oh my. I pray that when you're here, I've often said the goal for the services at the upper room are not to make everybody feel good. I don't preach to make people feel good. I don't preach to make people feel bad. I preach to make people feel how they should feel. It depends on where they are spiritually. If you're right with God, you'll love my preaching. If you're not right with God, then the word's going to step on your toes. Now, the right response to the word finding you is not to get rocks in your jaws against the preacher. Get up and walk out. That's not the right response. The right response is to get right. The right response is to ask God to forgive you. Thank God that the word found you. Thank God that you could recognize being found in the word and then get right with God. Because you can walk out of here and walk into judgment and never get that opportunity again. Can I get a witness? How do you respond when you hear God's truth? Those who are streaming today at your church, is the gospel being preached well enough to convict and to discomfort the comforted and then to bring comfort to the righteous? Praise the Lord. Well, we just enjoy our services we don't bother anybody. We don't get into all that stuff. There's a word for it. It's called lukewarm. The lukewarm church is, uh, the condition of lukewarmness is also, it's debilitating, but it is also a dignified condition. Oh, if you want honor, if you want the world, if you want to be popular, the world will honor this condition it is popular with the world it does not produce enthusiasm for spirituality the world likes that it doesn't cause antagonism about sin the world really likes that the world loves a church where the preacher don't bother anybody where the conviction doesn't challenge anyone praise the Lord well, there's our preacher. Praise the Lord. They love the preacher whose sermons amount to a little more than chicken soup of the soul. I just come to encourage you. And everybody, everybody, the gambler, praise the Lord, tunes in. The pimp tunes in. The serial killer gets encouraged. The liar is inspired because I just come to encourage you. The Lord didn't, didn't call me to Preach against things that divide you like sin. I just want to encourage you. Oh, the world loves the lukewarm preacher. Oprah invites the lukewarm preacher on her show. Because the lukewarm preacher is not going to sit there and tell her you should be shacking up with Stedman. And find something else to talk about. See, they love, love that. See, that's what the lukewarm preacher does. The world loves that stuff. The lukewarm preacher is the preacher who in every sermon search for common ground. Let me see what I can talk about that will make all of us equally happy. And I will not deal with anything that offend anybody's sensibilities. That's lukewarmness. And the world loves that stuff. Lukewarmness. Lukewarmness makes the church a friend of the world. I wish I had a praying church. Amen. I'm telling you, praise the Lord, the truth. The Bible says in the book of James, chapter 4 
and verse 4. James cries out. He said, you adulterers and adulteresses. And what he's speaking of here in this particular context is spiritual adultery. He says, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. The word enmity literally means a continual bad relationship. So if you get into a good relationship with the world, then you become in a relationship with God that's filled with enmity. Now, so now look at this. Then he says, uh, whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. We need to read this to all of the Christians on the voice. All of them who are trying, and the rest of you, who are trying to win the world's approval. Do you not know that to win, praise the Lord, with the world? Get off of me. Say amen. amen. To win with the world is to be in enmity with God. Praise the Lord. And I'd rather be in a good relationship with the Lord than a good relationship with any of you in here. Now, brother, you got to help me. I told you I got a weak voice today, so he's in a trance. Come on and pay attention to me. Y'all y'all move me up. So you want to be in a good relationship with the Lord. And see, when you move in and when the world begins to grab you and the world hugs you, and the world praises you. Like that, like that uh, homosexual the other day who was praising uh, Reverend Baba. And uh, uh, the, the, you know, the Reverend is stepping down from the NAACP. And uh, on, I saw on Spectrum News, the man who was praising him is an out-of-the-closet homosexual. Talking about the tremendous job Reverend Baba did. I don't want praise from the wicked. Don't want no evil man married to a man and pushing a program that's against the word of God, praising me as a good preacher. Sometimes, praise the Lord, who praises you? That's a conviction. And sometimes who criticizes you? That's a compliment. I'd rather have the criticisms of the world and the praise of God than to have the praise of this wicked world and to be in a bad relationship with my Lord. Do I have a witness in here? The lukewarm church is in a good relationship with the world. Praise the Lord. The world respects the lukewarm preacher because the lukewarm preacher stays in his place. The lukewarm preacher preaches a sermon that offends no one. Oh my, that gets nowhere. Praise the Lord. The world can accept this kind of Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.